suitable for a young warrior to own. Deadly, gives you some space between you and your opponent. And it's cheap, because it only has a small amount of metal in it. So spearheads can still be very long. Greeks described the Celtic spears heads as being as long as most people's swords. And their swords as long as most people's spears. The real classic weapon of the Celts was the single-handed broadsword and the long shield. And now we're going to show you a melee between two warring Celtic tribes with a bone to pick. They might be fighting over a particularly good field or a river. These two men have a legitimate grievance, and all will interfere with them if they choose to settle it by force of arms.
incredible struggle. You must have about 50 wounds in your by now. <laughs> Survivors will now cheer. <laughs> That's an amazingly good fight. I will offer up a short prayer to Louis, the Celtic god of the fire and the sun, and say, let the dead arise. Just look at that armor sparkling. <laughs> the second legion under Vespasianus, later to become a great emperor, rolled west in 44 or 45 AD and started the campaign to subdue the Duratrigi, the tribes people of this part of the world, and later those further down in Devon and Cornwall. It took him about, it took the soldiers about 10 years to subdue the whole of the southwest because unlike other parts of the country, in the south at least, the Duratrigis put up a hell of a fight, primarily because they had a large number of hill forts from which to operate from, about 20. And Vespasian fought 30 battles and took 20 hill forts in a short number of years before he was recalled to Rome and handed over to another legionary commander. This is a detachment of Roman Imperial legionaries and auxiliaries. There's about 50 of them. A legion would have 5,000 men, and a large proportion of the second legion formed a ring of steel around Maiden Castle before the final assault. The lone Roman troops have swung very easily there from a long thin column into almost a solid block. They display military precision and discipline, largely unknown to the Celts, maybe because the Celts don't think it's necessary. It certainly isn't for their form of warfare. It's much more about looking heroic and being the best warrior. And from column, the troops deploy into line on that hillside. Behind them, the Roman cavalry appear. Imagine a legion coming forward, all the cohorts or battalions, rank upon rank, reserves following the main line, steadily down the hill. Imagine your Celtic army. You've got your spear and your sword and your shield, and not much else. Every single Roman soldier is better armed and equipped than the very best of the Celts. The Romans are a ruthless military machine. They would bring a form of civilization that the Celts didn't really want. Civilization nonetheless, but in order to impose it, first the rather nasty fighting. Flapping overhead is the Vexillum, the standard of the Second Legion, a flag carried when the detachment of the Legion was on active service. It's not the Imperial Eagle, there's one Eagle per Legion, and that would be carried when the Legion was in the field en masse. So this is a Vexillum, a small flag to denote the Legion. Behind the line of Legionaries are the Auxiliaries, the skirmishers, protecting the rear. They can rush out to the flank, they can attack frontally while the legionaries await. And overlooking this impressive parade of troops is the image of the emperor himself. Carried on a pole, bronze image of the emperor, so the troops know what he looks like. The line again becomes a column with amazing precision. The armor sparkling in the sunshine, a sight that would have totally dismayed the Celts because they can see how well armoured their foes are and how well disciplined they are. Indeed, many of them may have fought the Romans before and known that unless they had overwhelming odds, it was completely hopeless. At the head of the column marches the Centurion, the company commander. He commands a legionary block of citizen infantry finest that Rome could recruit. Behind him march the standards and the horn player that relays the orders in battle. Behind the block of legionaries we have the auxiliaries, the native troops who would have been recruited into the army, probably most of them Celts themselves, but coming from a different tribe they wouldn't mind fighting the Duratrigis because Celtic people were very warlike. Ladies and gentlemen, 
we have before you the one of the finest reenactment groups in Europe, consisting of the Owen Street Guard and the Gemini Project from Holland. Please give them a very warm welcome. As they march past, you'll notice the incredible contrast between these troops and the Celtic people you've seen before. The column becomes long and thin again, so they can manoeuvre past the artillery. They're all to the word of command. The troops all marching in step, something the Celts have no need for or no wish to pursue. But in the sort of warfare the Romans carry out, marching in step, precision displays, Military might is very important for marching step. The sun's come out, and now you actually see the Roman armour at its very best. All the armour and equipment you see today has been made by the members of the Omen Street Guard and the Gemina Project. They're not only reenactors, they're also skilled craftsmen. They spend hours polishing this armour. It's not stainless steel or anything like that, it's just ordinary mild steel and bronze. It takes a lot of polishing. Round they go, making a very colourful sight against the blue sky. You can almost feel how appalled the Celts would have been, as maybe as many as 5,000 legionaries and auxiliaries surrounded Maiden Castle in a vice-like grip and began their methodical attack against which the Celts had no defence. The Romans had artillery, they had throwing javelins, they had discipline. The Celtic fortress was very fine against other Celts, but against the methodical Romans, it could not hold. Furthermore, they knew how ruthless the Romans could be. As everybody knows, through history, the fate of a besieged town that refuses to surrender is a very, very bad one once the troops get inside. <laughs> Stand easy, and in a minute, the, the Magnifer, the chap who is carrying the image of the Emperor, will come across and tell you about the Roman army, its tactics, and its equipment. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's tell you something about the soldiers, in, in this case, of bear skin. All Roman musicians and standard bearers wore animal skins over the helmet as part of the badge of rank. Next we have the Cornican, who carries this large circular horn called a cornu, which would be used to give commands on the march, in the camp, and in battle. He wears a mail shirt, similar to the auxiliaries, but this one has shoulder pieces to give extra protection. Over the helmet, once again, is an animal skin, in this case a wolf skin, the wolf being sacred to the Romans, following on from the story of Romulus and Remus and the founding of Rome. Next we have a Vexillarius, who also has a wolfskin over his helmet. If a detachment of soldiers were sent away from a legion to do duty elsewhere in the province or elsewhere in the empire, they would take with them a Vexillum. This is a flag-type standard which shows the legion from which the soldiers have come. And the emblem on this Vexillum is the Capricorn of the Second Augusta, and that was the legion which besieged and captured Maiden Castle. I'm wearing the uniform and equipment of an Imagnifer, and one of my colleagues is now taking the image around. This is the image of the Emperor, who at this time would have been the Emperor Claudius. In an age before, obviously, television, photographs, even um, any other sort of portrait, this was a way in which the Emperor could actually be seen by the soldiers who served him, and also by the people who he was conquering. And it also allowed the Emperor to be present with the troops, if spirit in not in body. I also wear an animal skin with my uniform. In this case, it's once again a bear skin. Second in command of a century of 80 men would be the Optio. This man is chosen by the Centurion. He's therefore the Centurion's option. If the Centurion was injured or killed in battle, the Optio would automatically know to take over command as the second in command. He's dressed as a legionary soldier, but with more elaborate equipment. He also has several badges of office. One is the ring, one on his finger, and the second is the knob staff, the staff with the silver knob on the end, which is carried as a badge of rank. On his hip is a small pouch, a leather pouch, in which could be carried a wax tablet, which might contain the orders of the day or the password. 
In command of a century of 80 men would be the centurion. And we have two centurions who started to march around now. You'll see their dress is very different from the other soldiers. It makes them very distinctive and easy to pick out in a hurry in the heat of battle. On the helmet, you'll see a transverse crest, which goes from side to side. This would be made of either feathers or horsehair, as is the case here. Each wears a short mail shirt over an elaborate leather arming doublet. On their shins, they wear thin bronze greaves, which have been silvered. All centurions would, walk, would wear greaves, not for protection, but as a badge of rank. Each carries a cloak over his shoulder, which is once again a badge of office. And finally, the vine staff, which could be used to administer casual corporal punishment if necessary on the soldiers. If the centurion had been awarded for valour in combat, these would be in the form of medals called phalari. These were awarded in sets of five, seven or nine and are worn on a harness on the chest. You'll also see that both of the centurions wear a pair of torques. These were the neck rings which you would have seen on the Celts. The Romans adapted them and took them over and gave them out as military awards. Next we have with us today a senator. This would be a gentleman of high aristocratic rank who would serve in the Senate in Rome, perhaps equivalent in modern terms to the House of Lords. He's wearing a woolen tunica and over that is the toga, some 20 odd feet of wool, forming a garment which is worn around the body. The broad purple stripes on the tunica and the toga mark him out as a senator and a man of this rank could be the governor of a province or the commander of an army legion. Following him are two Roman ladies. Whilst I said that the soldiers could not legally marry, this ruling did not apply to centurions and ranks above the centurion. They could be married and their wives would live with them in camp. Our ladies are dressed in the simple manner which you would find in the provinces. There's a tubular garment called a parlour. This is held in place by brooches, and over that is the stola, which is the female equivalent of the toga. Each of the ladies also wears a pair of boots, and in the soles of the boots are hobnails, as those worn on the soldier's boots. Now we're now going to sit on the cornu to summon our cavalrymen. <laughs> So the corner kind of sounded the horn as an indicator to the cavalrymen that they should now advance. The Romans recruited their cavalry from Celtic people who had an ability and a propensity towards riding and those skills were brought into the Roman army and adapted for Roman use. Roman cavalry units were called ala, which in Latin means wings, and would be comprised of up to 500 or sometimes a thousand men in the regiment. Now as the right past you'll see the soldiers and their mounts are very elaborately equipped which means they would be very expensive troops to set up and maintain. You'll see the riders wear elaborate helmets, more elaborate than those of the uh, foot soldiers. Each also wears a male shirt with a large cape to give extra protection on the shoulders. A short pair of trousers called brachi to protect the legs and spurs over the boots. They each have a flat oval shield and a haster or stabbing spear as well as a spartha which is a long sword longer than the infantry version by some four inches. Notice also that the riders don't have any stirrups. That's because the saddle, which is a very uh, robust and well-constructed wooden tree, also has attached to it four horns, one in each corner. And these allow the soldiers to get a good seat and a good grip in the saddle without need for stirrups. The saddle is helped to remain in position by the elaborate uh, leather strapping to the front, the breaching at the back and the breast strap, which are heavily decorated with bronze fittings which have been silvered or tinned. These serve a decorative purpose but also helped by their sheer weight to keep the straps down and in position. The cavalry would be used to scout ahead of the army and also during a battle would be held on the wings of the army to protect it, but also so that they could be unleashed as soon as the enemy was defeated. So those are the sort of soldiers which would have come to Maiden Castle and besieged it, but before they got that far, they had to be recruited and they had to be trained. 
And what we'll now do is show you some of the training methods which we know to have been used by the Roman army. On joining the army, the raw recruit had probably had no military experience. If he had, possibly as an enemy of Rome, then he would have certain bad habits, which would have to be taught out of him, because these would not be suitable for application in the Roman army or the way it fought. The Romans preferred to recruit people from a manual or agricultural background, so they'd already be fairly hardy and tough and there were certainly requirements with regard to health and particularly stature in terms of height, which were applied at different times during the empire. On joining the army, the raw recruit would be subjected to a four-month period of training. He'd learn particular skills and also general skills, which included archery, riding and swimming. You can see various activities going on now, which have all been described by Roman writers. There are pairs of soldiers practicing with wicker shields and wooden spears or swords. Uh, these wooden uh, mock-ups were often made more heavy than the real thing, so that if the soldiers became used to using the practice weapons, handling the real weapons would actually be easier for them. There's a small group of soldiers doing the basic square bashing, learning to march in step, march as a body, and listen to and order commands. And you'll also see some pairs of soldiers practicing throwing uh, wooden, wooden shafts, therefore they're practicing the peel and throwing, both learning how to throw the missile and also to do it whilst wearing armor. When on campaign, the soldiers would each be expected to carry certain equipment and rations of their own, and you can see a soldier walking around, or rather marching around, with the marching pack, which was comprised of a number of leather bags in which would be several days rations of grain, and other auto individual tools and pieces of equipment. So that gives you a glimpse of the sort of techniques which we use to train the infantry. What we'll now do is try and compress into a few minutes the cavalryman's training. Starting with the basic practice with dummy weapons against dummy targets. When training the cavalry, it was not just a case of training the men, but also training the horses. Since the Romans tended to recruit from the Celtic peoples, there's a fair chance that they already knew how to ride, but just as in the modern British army, riding skills which you might have picked up elsewhere might not be appropriate to the style of operation and the style of fighting which you might wish to apply in an army. And so there's a re-education process, particularly for the men, but possibly also for the horses. The two horses we have with us today are about the largest you would find on uh, a Roman cavalry regiment. The Romans tended to use small horses by our standards, but we know from skeletal evidence what the maximum size was, and the two horses we have with us today are probably at about that height. So each, each of the riders now has a practice hester. You see we've got two dummy targets, and notice the overarm method of holding the spear. This is something which is shown very commonly on Roman tombstones and Roman sculpture. But our second rider will demonstrate the other way of using it, which is underarm. So forward he goes. Because what the rider's got to do, even though he's got a good reach with the lance, is get the horse close to the target. As the training develops, the horse will become more used to this, and later on the horse itself will be used as a weapon, aiming to try and push the enemy soldier over, and possibly to kick and bite him in the process. So one of our riders has now picked up some throwing spears. These are a weapon which could be used by cavalry, to actually get at an opponent who's slightly out of reach, but more to the point, to be able to keep out of reach of the opponent. First of all, though, one of the riders goes forward with the real Hester with a sharp point. Demonstrating the overarm thrust. 
And that's why they carried a sword as well as a spear, because if it sticks into an enemy's body, you can't really stop and pull it out. Now they're throwing spears. Which, as you can see very clearly, very effective weapons. Now you'll read still today in many books which have been written in recent years that the Roman cavalry would not be very effective because they didn't have stirrups. There is this idea that the stirrup, when it comes into use at the end of the Roman Empire, is somehow the magic formula to make horsemen effective. And it's only been in recent years that research has been carried out on a practical basis, such as what you see today, into the Roman saddle, uh, taking archaeological evidence and looking at it afresh, and then trying to reconstruct the real thing from the evidence which still survives. Well, an archaeologist uh, called Peter Connolly in particular has done a lot of work around this, and I hope you'll see today that the lack of stirrups doesn't really pose much of a problem for our riders, nor would it have posed a problem for the Roman cavalry. So once again with the throwing spears. Now this opponent's lying down, trying to avoid being hit. So the riders now take up their wooden practice swords, similar to the infantry swords. And there'll come a point when practicing against the dummy has got the horse over its initial reluctance, and you now need to practice against the live target who's moving about. So two of our infantrymen now come forward. I will now see some hand-to-hand -hand practice. You'll see that the cavalrymen have good cover on their left-hand side, which protects them, whilst they actually attack their infantrymen using their right hand. Now, the big advantage of the cavalry is momentum. If they can keep moving, if they can keep going under some impetus, they've got a big advantage over the infantrymen. Once it slows down and turns into a hand-to-hand -hand fight, then the infantryman's got certain advantages, particularly, of course, if he's prepared to attack the horse. I think a few points there scored by the infantrymen, but in fairness, I'd say this is the first time that one of our cavalry has become on horse. So forward with the spear now. Around again. Oh yes, and into the back of the neck. Now this particular infantryman is fairly short-sighted, which can be an advantage. <laughs> or not. And I think I'm right in saying that that practice spear has gone through the shield. Yes? Which just goes to show you that uh, if it had been a real spear and it had stuck into the shield, once it might have protected the infantryman, he could not carry on fighting with a spear sticking out of it. He'd have to throw it down. So that's another trophy for the wall, I think. However, there's still a score to settle here. We'll now have one very annoyed cavalryman. Aha! Two on to one, is this fair? Well, who's... Who's bothered about fairness? The Romans weren't. And here we have heroic combat. <laughs> so, the training over. The soldiers go forward to join their units, off onto campaign, and a chance to use these skills.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you're impressed by that uh, display, especially since uh, these horses aren't real Roman horses, and one of them indeed only saw a Roman soldier for the first time a couple of days ago. <laughs> now then, with our Magnifer returning to the ranks, we will see how this training was put to deadly effect on the battlefield and in sieges. A Roman once said that Roman drill was a battle without blood, but a battle was drilled with blood. There's no difference between drill and combat, except in the real thing, the soldiers kill. We're looking at here a highly trained killing machine, glamorous perhaps, but at the same time, like soldiers through the ages, their job is an unpleasant one. The column swings round, and we'll begin the first of the military manoeuvres. When you see these Roman tactical manoeuvres, remember our friends the Celts and how they fought and how difficult it would have been for them to resist this kind of drilled military might. The Romans weren't the only army to do this. The Persians did it. A lot of ancient armies marched in step, but it never actually extended to the north, to the Celts, who fought, as you've seen, as individual warriors, heroic, but perhaps against the Roman legions, uh, a little futile. The column becomes a line, and they'll advance up slightly before halting. Now then. When joining battle, the first thing the soldiers would do is lay down a barrage of artillery fire, which you'll see later on. And then they would close and throw volleys of javelins. Now we can't throw the javelins today because if we did, they're very dangerous. And of course, if they um, hit the ground, they'd bend and uh, it would take a long time to hammer them back again. So the soldiers are going to put their javelins down and draw their swords. So you can imagine the bodies of hundreds of javelins coming over, smashing into the front ranks of the Celts. Those of you on the ramparts here at the hillside, imagine you're a Celtic army. The first ranks decimated by javelins, the rear ranks smashed by the heavy balls coming over from the artillery, heavy arrows. And then the Romans really start to mean business. They send in the auxiliaries, trained skirmishers and very good at the close order heavy infantry tactics as well quite able to defeat the foe by themselves. The auxiliaries did in indeed do this. They'd come forward in large numbers and attack the front of the Celtic army. And if for any reason they weren't able to break through, that was just the start. Because ranged behind them in a checkerboard formation, every man able to use his sword and shield's best effect is the heavy infantry, the legionaries. You'll notice that they have plenty of space, and the second rank covers the gaps in the first, so they can step in and take over if there's a casualty, or stab any Celt that manages to bash his way through the line. The shield is a weapon in itself. You can punch someone in the face or catch him under the chin with the top edge and stab him while he's down. One stab from these swords is all it takes. They come forward without yelling and screaming and making a show. This deadly precision is very, very unnerving to an organized and disorganized enemy not used to this sort of thing. Obviously, there will be reserves to follow up, and if necessary, the leading Roman troops could retire to lick their wounds and their place taken by fresh reserves. The Celts, being not so organized, wouldn't be able to do this, and they'd be standing in the front ranks exhausted and tired, and up would come another body of fresh Roman troops. You notice that they're not armoured at the back, they don't need to be really, because they are in combat against Celts who cut down onto the head and shoulders and the front with their slashing swords. And so this is the bits that are armoured by the Romans. And unencumbered by armour around their waist and on their legs, the Romans could build roads and run about and do lots of things which uh, heavily armoured troops wouldn't be able to. However, there are occasions when perhaps the Celts would race round the flanks of a Roman army Perhaps there wouldn't be enough cavalry to deal with them, or perhaps there were just too many Celts. And so the Romans could form a square. Primarily a defensive formation, it was able to move in any direction. As you can see, each side has the shields brought round the body to face outwards. It's hardest for the troops on the right, because they've got to bring the shields right from the left over to the right. Changes direction without even stopping. And the only vulnerable part is the rear, 
and if they attacked from the rear, what would happen is that the formation would simply stop and face about. You can see it's quite uh, a slow sort of formation, not ideal for attacking. You really only use it if you really are surrounded by a horde of tribesmen. You can use it to advance or you can use it to cut your way out if you're in trouble. The standards safely in the middle, the one thing the Romans wouldn't do is let their standards go. Terrible disgrace. There was a great disaster in Germany at the start of the first century where three legionary standards were lost to Germanic tribesmen and the Emperor Augustus at the time never got over it. So you guard your standards and you fight the last man around it if necessary. Quite difficult to hear commands sometimes as a Roman because all your equipment is clinking, you're bashing into the man in front with the shields and things. It's actually quite loud to be in the middle of a Roman formation. Notice how the armour glints beautifully. And some of the soldiers have got bronze helmets on. The steel helmets are probably more modern by Roman standards, but uh, there's no such thing as planned obsolescence, so you keep the bronze ones if they do the job. Now they swing back into line and they'll put the swords back into the scabbards. This is quite difficult because you can't see where the scabbard is because the cheek pieces are a bit like blinkers on a racehorse. You just have to know from practice where to put the sword. Now one of the most famous of all military formations, the Testudo or Tortoise, used to assault the gates here at Maiden Castle. It's not a battle manoeuvre, it's actually designed for a siege and it's not to fight in, it's to march right up to a gateway and stand there so engineers can come up and under the cover of the shields chip away at the wall or set fire to the gate. In combat they'd also have shields on the sides of, it, of the formation, although we're not quite sure how it was done because you run out of arms, but it was done. <laughs> Each soldier holds his own shield, interlocks with the next, and holds his neighbour's shield as well. They march very slowly and carefully so as to not tread on the man in front. Mustn't lose formation. And this would go right up to the gateway. And here this would have happened. The engineers would have stormed in under the soldiers' legs, chipped away at the gate, the gates would have fallen, and the assault troops would have gone in. Literally, these troops just stand there and take it while the Celts rain down stones and spears and slingshot, anything they can throw down. But because they didn't have boiling oil, their only effective form of defence was denied them. Chuck boiling oil on top of this and it's very nasty for the soldiers underneath. But only the ancient armies in the East had that. Now, those of you who were directly in front of the Testudo just then, we will invite you please to stand up and maybe retire slightly up the hill because you're about to experience what it was like to be a Celtic army. We're asking you to stand up just for your own safety. Don't worry, but it's just a precaution. If you've got any cameras, now's the time to get ready, because you're about to experience probably the last thing a lot of Celtic warriors ever saw, and that is an arrowhead wedge attack, a formation that's still used by riot police today. It's so effective. It's effective because it's psychological as well as physical. Your natural inclination is to get away from the point of the arrowhead, move to the sides. And as you do that, it just makes it easier for the Roman troops to cut their way into your formation, leaving room for the reserves to come up behind and smash through into the centre of the Celtic army. Tactics like this destroyed far bigger armies of Celtic troops than the Romans possessed. Sometimes 10 to 1 uh, against, they could still beat the Celts using this sort of tactic. Out come the swords. Out with a flash to intimidate the enemy. The shields are banged to further frighten the warriors. The warriors, too noble to retreat, suicidal to attack, all they can do is stand their ground and wait for the impact. Many of the warriors without shields anymore because the pedo has pierced them. This is the last thing many Celtic warriors ever saw. First the methodical advance, and then at the last minute the fully fledged charge. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you stood your ground or will you run like hell? <laughs> Thank you.
down now. And we hope no one got squashed. So now the soldiers will form our line and march back to collect their javelins before proceeding on the next part of the display. You notice there that during the attack the cavalry are on the flank protecting the wedge from a sudden attack from the side. Back they go. It's quite difficult to stay in line at the Romans because you can't see sideways very easily because of your cheek pieces. The Optio marching behind, making sure the line's straight, and the Centurion ready to wallop anybody over the head with a vine staff should they displease him. And the swords go back once again. Now we're going to get on to one of the most interesting parts of the Roman military display, the firing of artillery weapons. First of all, up come the javelins. Standards come to the front, it's safe now. And the line becomes a column, the flank swinging inwards. Again, showing the superb discipline of Roman infantry. Now, artillery. The Celts didn't have any artillery, they had slings, and slingshots could go quite a different distance with some accuracy. And they thought that places like Maiden Castle were proof against any missile, but the Roman artillery outranged the sling, and when they attacked, they bombarded the defenders on the outer ramparts with arrows and stones, forcing them back from the ramparts. Then the Romans went in, captured the first set of ramparts, and started all over again. A methodical advance, rampart to rampart, then to the gate, using the testudo, cutting their way through, and then into the center of the hill fort, where they created mayhem. And it was these artillery weapons that made that possible. And I'll now hand you over once again to the auxiliary magnifier, who will tell you about the artillery weapons, how they fired, and how they were made. Now you can see today three artillery weapons which the Romans used, both in battles and particularly in sieges. And it's very possible that each of these types of weapons would have been used here at the Siege of Maiden Castle. The machine over to my right, nearest the white tent, is called an onager. It's a stone thrower. The machine in the centre, the smallest of the three, is called a catapulta. It shoots large arrows or bolts. And the machine closest to the rampart, being manned by the auxiliary soldiers, is called a ballista, which also again, once again is a stone thrower. We'll shoot off each of these weapons and then we'll describe them in a bit more detail. You can see the crews preparing them, winding back the arms, getting the missiles ready. First the shoot is the catapulta, shooting arrows. Next the ballista, shooting stones. And next is the onager, shooting stones again. Now the Romans have no gunpowder or explosives, and so these machines got their power from twisted skeins of rope, which in ancient times would have been made of animal sinew, or possibly horse hair. The skeins of rope are twisted, and has an arm passing through each skein, and as the arms are drawn back, the skeins are put under pressure and tension, and releasing the machines loosens this tension, shooting the missile. The ballista and the catapult are each have two skeins of rope and two arms, and the onager has just the one skein of rope with one arm, which is going up in a vertical direction. Now the catapult are in a bit more detail. Each legion would have 60 of these machines, as you will have seen when the soldiers set it up, it's light enough to be picked up and carried about the battlefield. But we also know that the Romans mounted them on small carts, which would be drawn by two mules. And then these could be drawn into battle as a form of mobile field artillery. 
And with each legion having 60 of these machines, they can be lined up to put down a field of fire and possibly also to try and pick off individuals such as chieftains and standard bearers. And the Celts have got nothing with which to answer this. So as Maiden Castle is besieged, these machines would have been lined up outside the castle and would have been shooting their missiles high over the walls into the castle to hit the defenders behind the walls. Now as the blister is drawn back, what we'll possibly do is shoot an arrow, uh, sorry, shoot a stone high into the air. You need to send your missile as far as possible. Even if you actually can't see the enemy, you know that he's behind the rampart, and so as you pile over these hundreds of stones and arrows, many of them are going to find a target. The Onaga is particularly suited for this, shooting up high and over the wall. And now you'll see the same with the ballista. That it drops down behind the rampart. And the same could be done with the catapulter. The aim now is not to hit the target, but to shoot the arrow as far as possible. So imagine a flight of 60 of these arrows coming in together. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen, the deadly effect of the Roman artillery. Now we're going to the climax of the show. Something very important for Roman troops to do. That is, salute the standards and the image of the emperor. This reaffirms the loyalty of the troops to the emperor and to the legion. It not only makes sure that the troops fight their best, but on a higher political level, hopefully stop civil wars breaking out with local legions deciding it's time to go in alone. Unfortunately, this did happen a bit in the Roman Empire. So by showing their loyalty to the existing emperor, these troops will not decide to form their own little mini-empire. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's important for us uh, now that you come over and talk to us about the armor and equipment, ask the many questions you might have, look at the static display. Opening in the sunshine. have a choice. You can stay where you are and have a look at Secunda Augusta in their full dress red helmet crests who will be marching on shortly. You can follow the Ermine Street Guard and have a look at their armour and equipment or you can go and visit our Celts. I imagine after this display of military might you've got quite a lot of sympathy for the Celts now. Have and see what they had to face. First the advert. This event was brought to you by the Special Events Unit of English Heritage. We do about 200 events a year, but the first time we've done it, yeah, we hope you liked it. If you are not yet a member of English Heritage, and you'd like it. So, Legio Secunda Augusta, this is the Legion that took Maiden Castle. This particular group has been formed only two years, so they've done marvels to get all their stuff together in such a short time. Needless to say, all the rope groups here today consist of volunteers, sets of cavalry, and professional riders. And if you're interested in becoming a Roman soldier or a Celt, come grab yourself one and find out what it takes to join. Okay, it's now safe for you to cross the tape barrier. And if you want to have a look at the artillery weapons while the show's on, please do, but don't touch them because they're quite fragile. And please, whatever you do, don't let children pick up the weaponry. 
Finally, sorry to bore you about this, it would help us a great deal if you could take any litter home because we have a very small team here about the